thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, welcome. Uh, as stated before, this is a passion of mine. Uh, uh, doing doing this history started out by asking the question, what was going on in the North Shore? And I had my assumptions, and my assumptions were 100% wrong. And I proceeded to talk with the local community as to what was happening in the North Shore. Tell me a bit about yourself. I like to learn, I want to learn, and I want to be able to share this with others so that this history becomes more common knowledge. And in doing this, I started getting more and more involved with how the communities grew in the North Shore and its significance in the North Shore and then the uh, significance that it has not been included in general history. Uh, we really focus on this becoming common knowledge and so I look at our my lectures and things that we do with Shorefront as a collective, not an individual, I'm not the historian. I see historians sitting out there in the audience and I rely on these historians to tell a bigger picture. Uh, what we want to do with Shorefront is provide a home where all these different entities can bring their information and store it so that years from now, decades from now, hundreds of years from now, residents can come back to Shorefront, look their archives, and see what has existed. So hopefully today I'm going to show you something new, tell you a bit more about Shorefront, but also about interesting things that were happening in the North Shore uh, as it pertains to African American history. But to put that in context, I'd like to read that in 1809, the Illinois Territory adopted the Indiana Black Codes. So bond servants or slaves could not be more than 10 miles from their master's plantation or their usual place of residence without a written pass or letter of permission. Anyone had the authority to capture such servant and bring him or her before the justice of the peace for punishment, not exceeding 25 lashes. If anyone found another slave or servant near their dwelling without the permission of their slave master, they could punish the servant themselves by administering 10 lashes on his or her bare back. Unlawful assemblies by slaves or indentured servants were punishable by up to 39 lashes. Unlawful assembly was defined in 1808 as three or more slaves, servants, or servants of color for the purposes of dancing or reveling during the day or night. Those who were caught so assembled were to be brought before the justice of peace of the jail. The next day, unless the day was a Sunday, the convicted parties would be whipped on their bare back up to 39 lashes by the constable of the township where the offense occurred. This was all throughout Illinois' early history. And it maintained that type of status of the Black Codes up to 1848. Now I want to bring that to you know, fruition because I wanted to make sure you understand how Illinois as a territory kind of came to be and that it almost became a slave state, but it did allow slavery in the southern states for the salt mines that were there. But in essence, to be a uh, African American in Illinois, you basically had to be indentured. And sometimes you're sold or by permission of the courts to be sold to another family to continue that indentured service. Even then though, communities were developing. Illinois had itself at one point over 1,000 sundown towns. To this day, there is still some semblance of that, numbering over 400 cities or townships that still have those vestiges of sundown towns. And if you don't know what a sundown town is, it's basically when the sun goes down and if you're a person of color, you need to leave that town. Otherwise, you may be in jail. <coughs> So Evanston grew as a territory. At one point, Evanston went down as far south as Devon Avenue. Um, as the incorporation of Chicago, city of Chicago and more uh, formalized uh, incorporation of the city of Evanston, it grew to what it is today. Um, at one point, you wouldn't say that there was a black community in Evanston and that of Glencoe and that of Lake Forest. But as time went on, you had the purposeful movement of people of color, and also other ethnicities who live in certain parts of a community. And then with Evanston as the example, which I'll be coming back to a lot to because of the population of Evanston, you can most uh, visually uh, illustrate that. Um, you see how Evanston at one point had a black population that was scattered throughout Evanston. But during the course of 30 years, between 1900 and 1930, a population became massed into one area that we know now today as either the 
Elizabeth Ward of West Chicago, I mean West Evans. Lake Forest had a population, a small population, but it was one of the sites of the oldest black churches in North Shore. It was an AME church that was established in 1860. It stayed in existence until 1920. My thinking, though, in short point thinking, is that that church may have relocated to a, 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 a suburb further north of Lake Forest. But you see on the map there, which is kind of hard, I apologize for that, but the same area, in this area here, Sussley and Sussley right there, those two corners, was the, uh, the uh, black community in uh, Lake Forest. Lake also had a growing, fast growing African American community. Um, all along, uh, just a little bit west of Green Bay Road, there's a church there now called um, Mount uh, St. Paul AME Church that was established early in its history. Um, that family, uh, the, the, the community there had a steady growth until about 1930, 1940, when strict housing codes uh, started pushing not only the African community out, but also the Italian community out of the, uh, out of the Glencoe area. What we enjoy most from Shorefront, as we get this collective history of what was going on in the area, uh, stories about people and what they went through and what they've done and how we find these people and how we try and find families and descendants to give us more stories about what was going on in the general community. The photograph up here is of Andrew Scott, who served in Louisiana during the Civil War, was honorably discharged, moved to Chicago, then relocated to Evanston, where he built his house at 822 Crane Street. The house, if you go by it today, looks pretty much like it, is, uh, like it did then when he first built it. It stayed within the family for about 100 years, uh, until about the 1960s. He's also a founding member of uh, Second Baptist Church and Mount Zion Church. So speaking of churches, uh, in Evanston, we have three uh, historic uh, churches that have been here since before the turn of the century, before 1900. Um, Ebenezer A.M.E., uh, October 1882, Second Baptist in November 1882, uh, St. Paul AME Church in August 1884, and Mount Zion in August 1894. And many of the churches, you know, as they developed, and that's a whole other lecture by itself, but I love talking about the formation of uh, what I called it one time, the, the battle of who was for what church was first in Evanston. And it was down to Ebenezer and the Second Baptist. And there's a multitude of stories that came out through the papers. And I want to make sure, I'm, I'm going to keep my eye on one person in the audience who I consider the ultimate historian of Second Baptist Church. So I'll, she'll probably not if I get something wrong. Um, but I use this example of the two churches to help kind of illustrate why it's important to document and maintain our archival collection of a entity's history. Because what happens too often is that it, it, it gets whittled down to uh, just maybe uh, verbal history that's passed down from one generation to another generation and becomes more and more inaccurate over a, after a period of time. But uh, when I first started doing research and I you know, did this article on Second Baptist Church and Ebenezer Church and I said that Ebenezer was the first church founded, there was some pushback and I was trying to get this whole story together saying, so, you know, here we go, Ebenezer, or sorry, Second Baptist was the first church and how we had to protest because we were kicked out of Lake, Ford, uh, uh, Lake Street Church and we had to start our own church. And that just didn't make sense to me when I started looking through the census records and looking through the church charges and asking myself, well, if this church was founded in 1870, which was stated then, why would the members who left that church continue to tie to Lake Street Church for an additional 10 years as they're building their church? And if there were only designated to sit in the balcony, how is that possible when that balcony did not exist yet? <laughs> so those are the questions I had. And I wasn't trying to challenge, but I was trying to come up with the thought process of, what if there was a situation where the city wanted to take back land in downtown Evanston, but all you had to do is prove your history to keep your land? And if you don't have accurate records to demonstrate that, you risk losing everything that you have. And that was my only approach with this. And so I wanted to get it down on paper and just say, please, somebody prove me wrong so I can see what's going on, to put the story together. Um, it was fun, let me just say that. <laughs> uh, but it did get sorted out, and uh, fortunately what it did is it bred a 
whole new push for more research. And I have to you know, credit Rhonda Craven and all the work that she's done in documenting the Second Baptist history, uh, uh, Second Baptist Church history. She's done a wonderful job on that. So thank you very much on that. Another early person that I started following for a while, this is one of my first research projects on my own, uh, looking up uh, Madam H.M. Taylor as I first saw her name. For the life of me, I could not find her first name anywhere. So looking into the, uh, the, the, the directories, all I saw was Madam H.M. Taylor. Where else can I look? Since the day of Madam H.M. Taylor. Over and over again, until so finally I saw something that said her first name, Josephine. And from there, I was able to get more history about her and where she came from, Kentucky. Moved to Chicago, just south of the Loop area. Worked as a, a maid for a hotel. Moved, later moved to Evanston. And not only would her husband start a upholstery business, but also a hair salon, a hair, hair salon and a catering business at three different locations. So early business pioneer who also funded the, the salary of the first pastor of the Ebenezer Avenue Church. I think many of us have heard about the Butler's uh, Butler Livery Stables. And I look at this as another early example of entrepreneurship in the North Shore. We're a family that came from Kenosha, Wisconsin, sold all their land, bought all their goods here, and as a family started several businesses. Grocery stores, two livery stables, construction, a number of things. And they stayed as a family business with their multiple business ends for a better part of 30, 40 years in Evanston. The Butler building, they had three, uh, three or four buildings. Their main office at one time was located at Dempster, just uh, east of Judson Avenue, uh, and west of uh, Forest Avenue, where it is today. Um, then there were two houses on Grove Street, where the Chase Bank branch is now. And then you had two bigger, larger buildings. One that was on Elmwood, facing Davis Street, um, which is what this picture is here. And the last building that was torn down in the 1990s, that was located on Emerson Street, where now there's a high-rise uh, condo going up right now at this, at this time. You know, William Twiggs, who uh, came from Davenport, Iowa, and this is another one where the more research we do, the more outreach we do, we find new information. Because at one time I was looking at the census data, looking for his records. I can only go back so far. I didn't realize that William Twiggs took his mother's last name and not his father's last name. At the time, his mother and father were not married. He has a younger brother, we found out later on, that took the father's last name, Williamson. So once we found that information, we were able to trace back even further about uh, William Twiggs' ancestry, range I'm coming from, in Virginia. Uh, but he was born in Davenport, came to Evanston, attended Garrett Biblical Institute, became Sunday school superintendent for Ebenezer Andy Church. He started his own, he started working with a barbershop, then started his own barbershop, then started a printing business, and did that for the rest of his career, along with some other things that he's done with the city of Evanston and city sealer and worked in the city yards as well. But he's also known for really being involved in social uh, clubs, in social and civic clubs in Evanston. Uh, Knights of Pythias, uh, he was on the trustee of the Ebenezer, I'm sorry, the Emerson Street YMCA, which is a segregated YMCA in Evanston, and a number of different other organizations. He became more like the leader, a, a, a go-to person in the community. At one point, his office, when he relocated from downtown Evanston to where it is now, or where it was then, on Emerson Street, his printing shop was known as the History Den. We had these old photographs hanging up on the walls, and he would, people would come in, he would listen to his stories about how he came to Evanston, why he came to Evanston, um, what he's done, and the things that were going on in the North Shore. Unfortunately, his uh, office is burnt down in the late 1950s destroying pretty much everything except for his printing press, which now resides at the Evanston History Center. So I just want to showcase some of those people there early on in this history, because sometimes when we talk about early African history, a lot of times the assumption is that they're domestics and servants. There are more entrepreneurial spirits than domestics and servants. That was a job position they could have, but on the side they're doing a number of things afterwards. But during this, a community grew. And in Evanston, for example, I mean, if you look at this chart here, in 1860, you had two residents. They were pretty much indentured. It was Maria Murray and Hetty Corn. Hetty Corn disappeared from the census. I'm still looking for this one. 
But Maria Murray uh, married George Robinson, established her house, and they lived on Dempster Street um, between Judson and Forest as well. Uh, she stayed working with the Allen Bain family to her death about 1903, and buried next to them in the same plot. But that was like this whole sense of, like I mentioned earlier, where I was talking about indentured servitude that was kind of maintained sometimes even after the loss, that this was still kind of like a culture that was maintained in the North Shore. We can also see this really big growth after the turn of the century. From 1900, we were 737 African Americans living in the of Emerson area to by 1930, nearly 5,000 residents. And that also spurts like what was happening at the time. And later in our research, we came across a uh, young woman who's doing research. Her name is Doria Johnson, who was researching her ancestry about her great great grandfather who was lynched in Abbeville, South Carolina. He was a landowner, owned 400 acres of land tried to sell his cotton at the going price. He was told to get to the back of the line when the price would come down. He refused to move. A fight broke out. He won the fight, but he was arrested. In the middle of the night, he was dragged out of the prison, and he was lynched. And to be more specific, he was tied to the back of the wagon, dragged through town, shot, cut up, hung. A newspaper article went in the paper saying that those who are related to this person, you have 30 days to vacate your land. Otherwise, we cannot guarantee your safety. During this time, the, uh, the, the National Guards were called. This was in the newspapers. Nothing happened. She was able to trace the land ownership only through two transitions. So in essence, you could trace all 400 acres of land that belonged to this man. And the chance of that family ever getting their land back that was stolen from them is next to zero. But when I think about that, because when I was doing some early research and I was asking people, where did you come from originally, I kept hearing over and over again, Abbeville, South Carolina, Abbeville, South Carolina, Abbeville, South Carolina, to a point that I think that the entire black population that was it was Abbeville, South Carolina. <laughs> so that kind of explains some of this growth, because he was lynched in 1918, 1917, 1918, and then there, you know, why did families come to Evanston? But they also came to Evanston, they also came to, uh, to Detroit, Michigan, and uh, New York. So you have three different migration patterns. But a lot came here because there were already family members who were living here, and they said, just come on, there's jobs here, there are housing here, there's opportunity here. There's a chance to start life again. And you know, early in this whole transition, we talk about why did blacks come to the North Shore. And it's not that they came to Chicago first, but they came from the South or from Canada straight to the North Shore, to Lake Forest, to Glencoe, to Evanston. So there was this ongoing connection of what was happening, who was talking, who was bringing families up, and for what reasons. So it was a direct migration to the North Shore. As I stated earlier, too, you know, there was business diversity. We were just um, um, uh, servants and domestics, but there were business owners. In Lake Forest, there was the Matthews family that owned an ice cream parlor and a livery stable, and they trained horses at the Valencia Club, and they did hay rides and sled rides. They also had a livery business. They transported luggage back and forth from the train to people's houses. Uh, you had Sam, Samuel Dent, who also ran a livery stable, much like Henry Butler did here in Evanston. Samuel Dent did that in Lake Forest, and they all formed partners with each other in trading forces off as they traveled into Chicago. You had uh, Richard Day here in Evanston, who was a carpet cleaner and carpet layer. Uh, you had, uh, later on in his history, you had a gentleman that, um, uh, Asa Taylor, who developed a working model of a hydraulic hospital bed in his garage in Lenko. And we still find these interesting stories that are hard to find, but always interesting. Um, and kind of come, we come, come across these by accident. And one of them was uh, Thomas Dorham, who was a licensed veterinarian. He was the second degree licensed veterinarian practice. Did his practice, uh, he uh, had went to uh, college in um, Chicago, but opened his first office here in Evanston. So of course, my, my first question is always, why? Why Evanston? So it turns out that his sister was already living here in Evanston. Uh, started a family. So he came and opened his shop in Evanston, living with his sister and his uh, uh, brother-in-law. 
He only stayed in Evanston for three years. He went back to Kentucky, where he's from, and went on to a successful career as a veterinary, as a practicing veterinary, mostly with farm animals, horses. He was noted in the newspapers for larger cases of horse abuse, where he would go and examine the horses and determine how that horse died. Um, but the connection still was strong with Evanston, and he sent his son back up here to live in Evanston and go to school. And there was an early photograph that we found of a Wolverine uh, football team that was established about 1930, and their number 17 was Thomas Durham Jr. picture. <laughs> What's also interesting with this is all the side stories, because it turns out that Thomas Durham's sister-in-law married Booker T. Washington Jr the son of the founder of Tuskegee. Large connections here. So I'm showing all these connections here. What was going on in Evanston and the North Shore? They were bringing all these people here, and it wasn't documented. And that's what Shorefront really tries to establish and put that paperwork down and create archives that showcase these discoveries. Terry Smith is one of my favorites uh, to also look into and in what she's done in the community. Uh, she had history in Canada, moved to Lake Forest and lived there, uh, raised her family of five kids, then moved to Evanston and had her six kids. As a single mother, raised these six kids in and out of poverty. She moved a total of 17 times in one year. I'm sorry, in two years. That's a lot of moving with six kids, trying to find somewhere to live. She was a graduate of Fisk University, but she had this idea of employment. Uh, she took care of other people's kids. She taught piano. She taught English on her own, just to get some money left to buy. But what she started and established was an employment center. And that really brought her out of that. Uh, she ran that business for about 30 years, and she employed over 100 women throughout the North Shore. And she had strict rules of how her domestics were to be treated. She believed in that her domestic women do not scrub floors and don't do windows. That's a man's job. <laughs> there was a story where one employee called her and said, the lady I'm working for slapped me because I refused to mop the floors. I told her, if you look at the contract, we do not mop floors. So Carrie Smith called that family. And the woman at the, the woman in the house said, well, you know how these laundry meters are. You cannot question what I do in my house. She said, really? Come over. <laughs> the old woman found out that she was an African-American woman. She came there and goes, please, can I have my domestic back? And she said, no, and slammed the door in her face. That took some guts, didn't it? <laughs> she had her standards. She stuck to it. Uh, Bonus Thompson. Again, I love these research stories because you have to find out sometimes, you have to really investigate where to go to find these things. So we had this photograph that I saw in an old print, and I wanted to locate who was the original owner of this photograph. Turned out it was a former history teacher at Evanston Township, lived up in Glencoe. So I went up there to get the photograph, but it was his sister that knew the history, and his sister lived in Flossmoor, Illinois. So we went to Glencoe to get the photograph and then travel down to Flossmoor to get the backstory of what was happening with this. And then doing some research on our own about who this person was. What did he do? What did he operate? Bonus Thompson, a hardware store. He was a tenor, worked with tin. He also repaired cast iron stoves. His business was located now where there is a, uh, a, a gas station on the corner of where Abbotsbury kind of goes into Green Bay Road. That's where that uh, business operated. Around 1911, 1912, 1913, he passed away, and his wife continued the business for multiple years. I also like this photograph a lot, too, because I like to study this photograph, because in there, there's a lot of things that are happening in the window. And you see reflections of the window. So in there, you see the reflection of where the, the, the train tracks were ground level at the time. You see the steam engine of the Northwestern Railway. You also see a poster in there with 101 um, uh, Wild West rodeo that was coming into town and how they performed on the west part of Evanston when they were still open land. We have Isabella M. Garnett Butler, who trained as a physician. Her brother was Evanston's first African American dentist. 
uh, he had his practice on Benson Street, which is now right across the street where the David Street House stop is. Um, she got her degree. She had class, she took classes at Providence Hospital and uh, started a clinic out of her brother's office at first. And then I like to tell this, like, kind of make up the story here where Dr. Garnett, her brother, introduced him to um, um, Dr., uh, Dr. Arthur Butler. He was a student at Northwestern as well. And Dr. Garnett was also a Butler of uh, uh, Northwestern University student as well. How uh, they met, hooked him up, and started a family. The significance with this is that um, both Isabel Garnett and Dr. Butler started Evanston Sanitarium in Evanston. Uh, first out of their home in Oak, and then they moved to a clinic that they purchased a double, uh, a, a lot with two homes on the lot. The front home was used as the hospital, the Evanston Sanitarium, the rear home they lived in. The hospital grew. They moved to another location. Dr. Arthur Butler, unfortunately, died in 1924. And in his honor, they renamed the center to the Butler Memorial Hospital. Um, then another doctor donated his house, Rudolph A. Penn, who then this, the hospital was kind of known as the Penn House. And it was located on Brown and Simpson and Bridge Street. Right now, there's a building there now that's called the Lord Rainbow Association. That's where the community hospital grew from the early work of Dr. Isabel Garnett Butler. You see some photographs here where the Edison Center was first established. Then the Butler Memorial, which was not commonly known as the Penn House. And the community hospital as well as they were was really active. Another story and uh, document that we love to talk about is the Emerson Street YMCA. And again, it's uh, another case of discovery and trying to get uh, his accurate history. Uh, many decades ago, the Regal YMCA put out a publication uh, that talked about its history and how it formed. And out of the benevolent actions of the Y community, established the Emerson Street Y to service its black community. I started looking into that, and I started seeing some different things that were happening. And what we learned and what we found in this photograph, and sorry for the bad photograph of Reverend J.R. Talley, but that is the only photograph we can really find of him is clear. But he was the reason why the Emerson Street YMCA was developed. He was a graduate of the Hampton Institute of Virginia, moved to Evanston, walked into the Central Y and asked for membership, and he was denied membership because of his color. That did not deter him. He went on and found several business leaders and lay leaders and started a program similar to the YMCA and operated in open fields behind businesses in uh, West Evanston. Well, this kind of embarrassed the YMCA. They brought him back to the table a couple years later and hired him as executive secretary. He was to be in charge of the Emerson Street branch of YMCA, which yet still did not have a building. But with a series of fundraising activities, raised $10,000 and built their first building on Emerson Street. By 1930, they expanded the building uh, with the Julius Rosenwald Fund to double its size. But that was part of a bigger fundraising campaign that the McGall YMCA did to move their location from downtown Evans to the present location, raising a million dollars and then an additional $100,000 for the Emerson Street Branch YMCA to the facility. So that's what the building looked like when it first opened. July uh, 1914, uh, I think it was July 5th, they sold 400 tickets at $2 each, but the village only accommodated about 200 people, so there was another 200 people sitting outside for the celebration. The significance of the Emerson Street YMCA, and I'll quote uh, one woman that I interviewed about 15 years ago. It's been that long, really. 15 years ago, uh, Martha Wilhelmina Twiggs Walker, the daughter of William Twiggs, I showed you earlier, who said, and I'll paraphrase quote, but and I recorded this, and I asked her if I wanted, to, if she wanted me to delete what she said, and she said no, I want to keep it because that's how I felt. But she said, and I paraphrase quote. Whoever's idea was to tear down that YMCA should have a bullet put through their head. They ripped the soul out of the black community. This is where everybody went for social activities, to start churches, to meet, for internships, for tutoring, for room and board for Northwestern students, 
for social gatherings, to feel safe in your own community. At one point, uh, one out of five boys in Evanston were a member of the Emerson Street YMCA. Membership that was there did not transfer to the McGall YMCA. At a time when finally the McGall YMCA, the YMCA did not want to be a segregated facility when first started in the United States. It wanted to be integrated, but they knew it was not possible. So they developed the Colored Works Department. And that was uh, about 1890. And with that, they started building separate Y facilities to fit the needs of certain minority communities. But by 1940s, uh, the 19, late 1930s, 1940s, the Y said, not enough of this. We are the Young uh, Men's Christian Association. We need to be integrated. We need to follow the confidence of what we believe in. So they started this process of integrating all of the Ys. Evanston watched that process for 15 years as he tried to study how do we do this? How do we do this so we do not lose our membership, our current membership? They did surveys. They developed a committee of interracial action. And then they kind of narrowed that committee's name down to just the committee, then to the special group. And reading the minutes of the YMCA in the 1940s, you see some light cut discussion about that. And sometimes it was covered by saying there was a lively discussion on concern of the Emerson branch. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine what was going on at that time. They did surveys for all the clubs and organizations. What do you think about integrating the YMCA? And one group did uh, respond honestly back saying, if you integrate the swimming pool, we will see some membership and leave. A lot of contention then. There's also a time when that happened that the Emerson Street branch started losing its support. Um, Casting a darker shadow like, well, it's not, you're not meeting your standards. You're not raising the funds. We have to subsidize you again. Now, granted, the, the Emerson Street Branch YMCA was not a separate Y. Only by race it was, but really it was uh, structured as a club. Swimming club, Camp Echo, other clubs that were there. The Emerson, branch, Emerson Street Branch also was a club section. So where all these other clubs would get their budgets adjusted to meet their needs, the different terminology used for the Emerson Street branch to say subsidy puts a different light on that. But how do you have an organization raise the funds it needs to do things it needs to do when you have a substandard housing uh, facility to run your programs? So it's a catch-22. In a period of 10 years, it started declining. At the same time, the Central Y started its program to integrate as well. And after a couple of years, they said they're fully integrated. But at the same time, the Central Y was still hosting the Aunt Jemima pancake breakfasts. They opened a teen center called the Plantation Room, inviting everybody down. And the Plantation Room was decorated like a southern plantation. It's always a good way to uh, try and establish good community relationships. It's so all um, you know, uh, uh, variety shows in blackface. I don't think that really works that well. And with that, you know, in playing, we talk about um, civil rights. And most of us, when we talk about civil rights, we think about the 60s, late 50s, 60s, early 70s. But I really think back turn of the century. As the term then was used, fighting Jim Crowism at the North Shore. And there were many people that were involved in that, successfully suing uh, movie st uh, theaters uh, for segregated seating suing business owners for segregated sitting in their restaurants. Um, one, often, oftentimes one. But also, um, newspaper articles that came out talking about housing, schools, redlining, zoning, all these issues that sometimes now we're still struggling with today in the North Shore about housing, about affordability, about equal access to schools and businesses, things that really influence us now that happened and were argued about now over 100 years ago. Mm. And this is an interesting article because this deals with Garnett Place. And as I mentioned before, Thomas Dorham, whose son lived here in Evanston, he lived on Ayers Place before it was named Garnett's when this whole thing erupted in this article where this family moved there and how dare this family come there. Mm. Same thing was happening in Glencoe with the segregated beaches and the family sued and successfully won suit against the city of Glencoe to desegregate its beaches. 
based on the term of we pay taxes here. I have my beach dog. I should be able to do any beach I want to. And what symbolizes this fight for fighting Jim Crow. There's Alderman Edwin B. Jordan Jr., which has a huge tie-in with national history. I'm sure we're all familiar with the NAACP. But before, as that developed, there was called the Niagara Movement. And Edwin Jordan Jr.'s father was one of the 22 members of the Niagara Movement. Jordan grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, attended Harvard University and graduated from there. Uh, he came to Evanston to study journalism at Northwestern University, but only took a couple classes there at Northwestern. Um, he went on to become sports editor for the Chicago Defender and managing editor of the Chicago Bee. He also, locally in town, was fighting the red line of the school districts because he wanted to have his daughter go to a school in Evanston, and the school system was trying to push her to foster school. He fought that and won. And the way he structured his argument, the community was right for, we need you to run for Alderman. We're not being represented. He did run. He won. He was unseated that same day, that same night, accused of voter fraud. Two years later, he ran again, won by a larger margin, and held chair for 17 years. In the time that he was there in chair, uh, he desegregated the beaches here in Evanston, he had a deciding vote in integrating the movie theaters. He held integrated baseball games on purpose with his fifth ward badge on his chest, daring the police to arrest him for having integrated baseball games. And when I say this to kids, like, well, what's so big about that? I said, well, you know, at that time, if you're a black man and you hit a white man to tag him out, that's jailable. So integrated baseball games were illegal in the other But he held those on purpose in spite of the law to change that law. In our archives, we have several boxes of just his documents, his speeches, his letters of recommendation, uh, and, and other correspondences that he did with his 17 years of fighting. The Fleetwood Jordan Center is named in his honor because he fought for 17 years to have that center <laughs> built. His other profession was that he worked with the Chicago uh, school system. And he did a lot of surveys with schools in Illinois, and traveled throughout Illinois to survey the status of public schools in that area and their needs and their assessments. The other thing he did, too, was a series of speeches, and one of them was called Wings Over Jordan, where he went on a national tour to record, the, to, to do the speech over and over again. He has a series of letters that came back with uh, people requesting his speech for him to come. There is one existing recording of that that the family members have, and they have it somewhere in storage which they cannot find. So we're looking for that. As soon as we get it, you'll know because we're going to be airing it all over the place. <laughs> I did ask his son, uh, Spencer Jordan, you know, with all the speeches that he's done, what did he sound like? He said, well, he's from New Bedford. Sounds just like JFK. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, communities were established and growing, and things were happening in the North Shore. And the more we did research, the more and more we wanted to make sure this became public knowledge, common knowledge. This was everybody's history. We want to make sure that everybody knew this history. So how do we do this? We do exhibits, presentations like this, publications, uh, online journals. We have a student group that does work as well to document history from their point of view and include their history within our archives. So when we started, I started literally with a file folder. Um, there's a backstory with that, but I'll discuss it today. Um, today we have over 160 linear feet of archival material that researchers come and use on a weekly basis to produce um, uh, documentary video, publications, and uh, other uh, term papers, thesis, dissertations, things that are needed for their classwork. And this is all throughout the North Shore, you see these photographs here. They were from Glencoe here to Evanston. Just wanted a slice of life. And I wish I could get to all these pictures I see here can be its own lecture on its own and what it's done. Music, there's a huge music uh, uh, um, community here in Evanston. Uh, the Birth of Soul Music started with Patty Drew, same as working on a groovy theme. Uh, she lives here in Evanston to this day. You had uh, Donald Clay, who uh, same with the Foster Brothers, do well, then started his own record label company um, that birthed the Du 
Duval's, and the Duval's birth, the Duval's, and the Duval's birth came through. So how this whole family connection came together to build this, um, this whole thing. And there'll be one musician I'll talk about, or singer, that I'll talk about later on just a little bit. Everson had a princess. I mean, not literally. So during the uh, early part of the century, uh, of the 1900s, uh, there was, I'm sure many of us heard about the Marcus Garvey movement. Uh, there was another movement too, it's the Ethiopian movement. This is during the reign of King Haile Selassie. His nephew uh, got his doctorate degree here in the United States. He was sent here by King Haile Selassie to get his doctorate degree and also build relations in the United States with the black communities. His last university he went to get his degree, the official degree was at Howard University, where he met Dorothy Hadley. She was working registration. I guess their eyes met, do a little romance story behind that. Uh, Malik Ubayan was uh, involved at the time in an arranged marriage back in Ethiopia. Called her father and said, no, is that gonna happen? I found this young lady here that she's gonna be my wife. And three months later, Dorothy Hadley became Princess Dorothy Bayan. She was a war correspondent. She relocated to Addis Ababa with her husband. I want to read a little segment here because she used to write letters back home to her sisters here in Evanston. We had an engagement to meet the Majesties at 4.30 in the afternoon. Malco, of course, had been in the palace scores of times since we came. There are two palaces, the upper and lower. Her Majesty and, uh, met us in a room furnished with gold and, and furniture. Louis XIV style, I think. I feel foolish bowing and backing out so forth, seeing that as I have so little practice in this sort of thing. And every minute I was afraid I would get my feet all tangled up in my long skirt and go sprawling out on the floor. So wouldn't that have been something? Her and her husband, in forming relationships with the United States to fight off the invasion of Italy in Ethiopia, developed or started the Ethiopian Star newspaper in the Ethiopian World Federation. Both organizations, both, both the newspaper and the organization still exist to this day. And her husband and Dorothy started that organization in the 1940s. Now, they have one son, Malika Jr., who for a couple of years attended foster school here in Evanston. So we had a prince. Here he is. Captain Fred Hutcherson. Now, how many of you can remember your first car and how proud you were? So you are driving your license, get your first car, you're polishing out, trying to impress all your, your, your interests. Well, Fred Hutchison's father kind of topped all of that. His first vehicle was an airplane. At 17 years old, self-taught aviator. Taught himself by just reading through manuals and working with cardboard controllers. But he got so good at what he did, he started teaching at local airports. He wanted to fly for the United States Air Force but was denied because of the color of his skin. So he packed up his family, moved to Canada, and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, where he trained there. Upon graduation, his job was to fly and ferry uh, Spitfires and bombers across the Atlantic Ocean, thus becoming the third African American to navigate across the Atlantic Ocean. He logged in over 30,000 flying hours. He also had a radio license at that time, which was very important, and he was sometimes broadcast on public radio. The Pittsburgh Courier also picked up his travels and sometimes wrote the harrowing experiences of flying across the Atlantic Ocean, documenting one event where the fuel lines froze and a plane was dropped at losing altitude. And embellishment, embellishment, embellishment for many columns. Finally, at about 100 feet above the ocean floor, engines cut back on and remained safely to land. He tried to start an airport in Port au Prince, Haiti, that failed. Uh, but used that as a training facility for pilots in Haiti. Came back to the United States. Uh, he was a pilot for American, for British American Airlines. He was the first African pilot for South American Airlines and uh, flew General Trujillo at that time. Uh, he also started a charter service here in Chicago and flew out of Maysville, Midway, and O'Hare Airport. He was also very involved with the Bud Milken parades and the Fred Hutcherson Auxiliary Group. Often had floats there that won honorable mention and first place in a couple of uh, parades. And also, one time when he flew his plane, he landed on Emerson Street. <laughs> How's that 
pepper from now on. <laughs> How many of you are Duke Ellington fans? Okay, quite a few. That's good. How many of you have heard of Kay Davis? How many of you know that she lives here in Evanston? And the one person who raised my hand lives in her former house. <laughs> and what did you find? You found photographs of her in the cold shoot, right? And I didn't bring the pictures with me, but I had to. But there are photographs I was able to give back to Kay Davis of her, of her mother, holding her as an infant. She never saw those photographs before. And also in that box were books that her grandfather, William Twist, who I showcased earlier, had signed those books to my little granddaughter. I was able to give all those things back to Kay Davis. Now, Kay Davis, born here in Evanston, but also lived for the south in one of the southern suburbs of Illinois, but then came back for high school and Northwestern University where she studied music. She was also a huge Duke Ellington fan, and her and her friend went downtown Chicago one evening to see Duke Ellington in action and had a chance to go backstage and meet Duke Ellington. Now, again, I have to preface this. When I talk to kids about Duke Ellington, I have to break it down so they can connect with it. I say, okay, he was the P. Diddy of his time. He was Jay-Z. Am, am I dating myself now with Michael Jackson? But come on, give me a break. <laughs> so, you know, so they can get an idea of how important Duke Ellington was at that time. So here's Kay Davis backstage talking to Duke Ellington, you know, love your music, you know, I'm trying to imagine this conversation, and saying to him that, you know, I have my uh, presentation, I have to do at Northwestern University for my graduate studies. So then we came, she did her performance at Northwestern, left the stage with a round of applause, and that applause got louder and louder and louder, because Duke Ellington and his band was coming down the hallway, went up to the front stage and said, can you be in Boston this week? and proceeded to sing with Duke Ellington for seven years. And um, Duke Ellington used her voice more as an instrument, more than vocal, um, on vocalizing notes. Uh, she can be heard on, on Turquoise Cloud, Brown Penny, Mini Ha Ha, Nothing But the Blue by Al Hitler. She was doing the humming in the background of call and response. Um, and that's how it was pretty much worked with that. I think if the audio is loud enough, I might have a sample here. First I whispered, I am too young, and then I am old enough now. Uh, Joseph Hill, long history here in Evanston. Student at Foster School, teacher at Foster School, uh, principal at Foster School, assistant superintendent, uh, was the principal at the time when Foster School was uh, transformed into the Magnum School, which became King Lab School, and then finally superintendent of District 65, and now in honor of his legacy, the administration building, District 65 administration building is named after this gentleman here. And I do have a video here, and I hope maybe this will work properly. A person who has gone through and lived through both segregated and integrated educational experiences. Personally, I can say that there is really no comparison uh, between the two. Uh, a person who is living in an integrated school environment is living in an environment that is more real to life. This is the kind of situation that he's going to live, compete in, and he should have the opportunity to be exposed to this kind of situation as soon as possible. The kinds of attitudes that develop as a result of segregated uh, education, I think, are apparent to all of us. Many times, I'm sure that you have seen youngsters who just had very little, if any, motivation. And it's pretty hard to answer the questions that they ask. Why is everything around me the same? They need the opportunity to share and to interact with children from various cultures and from various backgrounds. I kind of got a feel of uh, what was going on at the time in 1967. I had the chance to uh, interview and work with the person who filmed this, um, Larry Brooks, who unexpectedly and unfortunately passed away um, about five, six years ago. But he left in our archives the original film of this and how it was adopted by school systems around the Chicago metropolitan area as a model of how integrated schools can work. This film helped make that way. 
And the assignment with Larry Brooks, which is interesting, who was a student at Columbia College, and his first project that he wanted to do was actually interview the vice lords in the south side of Chicago. And realizing how dangerous that might be, he opted to come back north to Evanston and do something about the school systems, which would be a little bit easier to deal with at the time. But his classmate and the, if you see the whole film, it's about 15, it's about 17 minutes. The uh, narrator of the film is Bob Surratt, his classmate. And his other classmate uh, that wasn't involved in the film, but his classmate film was um, um, the uh, founder of Soul Train, Don Cornelius. Attorney Mamie Spencer, whose role in fair housing played a huge role in Evanston and how um, fair and equitable housing was happening in Evanston. Uh, she was also uh, Evanston's first uh, uh, fifth ward, African American fifth ward alderman, alderwoman, uh, held office for two terms. Uh, her daughter today now is a uh, producer, and if you saw the show from uh, DuSable to Obama, that's her daughter's work that she did for PBS. Of course, we know William Logan, or we should know William Logan. We know Bill Logan. He was Evanston's uh, first uh, American police chief. He also had a good conversation when I was doing research on Emerson Street YMCA, how he and his, uh, and his uh, partner uh, with the police force Went into the Emerson Street, um, went, went into the McGall YMCA to ask for membership in uniform and was denied because he's colored. He was also what, you know, with all that with his career, he was also the founder of Fellowship of African American Men, which still exists today, doing basketball camps and tutoring services, and serviced the entire North Shore, and also the Chessman Club of the North Shore. We also have Sanders Hicks, who was Evanston's first African American fire chief here in Evanston. Um, one of the things he did, which was really great, was that he established a speed skating club at Robert Crown Center. And with that, he was training a young six-year-old uh, six Shawnee Davis. He continued to train him up to his Olympic status. Right here in Evanston. How many of you know that Center Six had a sister? Ellis Lucille Tregay. Now, we have a video. Her, her experience in civil rights was so extensive that Shorefront uh, put together a video, a documentary, of her experience in the civil rights movements in Chicago and what she had done. Uh, I wish I had her resume with me, but it's about three pages. Uh, being a lobbyist for the state of Illinois, working in the fight to combat uh, overcrowding schools in Chicago, uh, what was known then as Willis Wagon breaking up neighborhoods and communities and, and, and integrating communities and purposely joining all white congregations and trying to bring in a mix of people in there. Now, keep in mind, Al is about this tall. And she's fighting a system in Chicago politics. And she stood around. She's had threats. And I think her famous, uh, what she paraphrased to me was, uh, this one politician came in and said, you know, don't you know I can hurt you? I can stab you right now. He said, yeah, and I'll bleed. I'm going to keep on fighting. I don't know what I was saying then, but I wasn't backing down. <laughs> um, but the work that she did in the Chicago area and how she brought a mass of people who were just ordinary at the time and then went on to do some history-changing events. She was part of the Operation Breadbasket, which led to Operation Push. She started the Political Action Committee. And if you're a politician of any salt in Chicago, you went through that course. That's the course that she designed. She's still an avid voter registration registrant, still working, uh, still working on Operation Push, still doing voters. Uh, she was a VP, uh, working with VP of Walter Mondale. Uh, checking out sites before his arrival, working with security teams and, and owners to make sure he had a safe route in and out. Um, traveled a lot to Springfield as a lobbyist for equitable housing. Um, worked with the Harold Washington mayoral cam um, campaign, uh, the Jimmy Carter campaign. Um, I'm missing a whole lot of stuff because I can't remember the whole three pages verbatim, but just an amazing woman and someone that should be researched and studied extensively for the work that she's done behind the scenes that made a lot of things change in Chicago. And of course, we know Honorable Lorraine H. Wharton, who we still officially call our mayor. 
<laughs> graduated Northwest University and began teaching here in Evanston at the Foster School. She later taught summer school at Nichols uh, Middle School, then later as principal at Haven and, and an alderwoman, and then mayor for 17 years. She was the first African-American mayor, first Democratic mayor, second <laughs> female mayor. It's interesting. <laughs> so throughout this history, as we're seeing the demographics move around and shift, um, we want to always make note that we do cover the entire North Shore. And some of these stories that we come across and people are trying to find and develop archives and paperwork behind. I mean, we had uh, Village President James Webb, who was the Village President of Lenco uh, during the 1990s. Uh, Alderman Lionel John Baptiste was second ward alderman here in Evanston, and later Judge Lionel John Baptiste was the first Haitian uh, 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 alderman of Haitian descent. Peter Braithwaite, our current second ward alderman of Jamaican descent. Uh, Judge Mary Maxwell Thomas, who was a resident of Lake Forest, Illinois, grew up her entire life in Lake Forest, Illinois. And this is just four of hundreds of people that have done remarkable things in the North Shore that I wish we could really get into and, and talk forever, but I don't want to put anybody to sleep or you know, running out of time. And, but it's just the things that Shore Farm really tries to establish and show and share with everybody. And you can see with uh, our demographics, you know, with the census of 2010, of uh, the disparity of how the communities are changing throughout the North Shore. And no, as no Glencoe now is about 176, but at one time it was numbering 600, over 600 uh, African American residents. And this is the 2000 census. And also note Kenilworth, 2.2% uh, for residents. But now Kenilworth group, seven. We can see a shifting and some changing in some of the demographics in Evanston, Lenko, Lake Forest, how it's shifting around and moving around. But even more so, why it's important to document this history, keep an archive of that, and keep sharing and disseminating this information, not only to the public, but to schools and institutions, and use it as a resource to develop more works uh, that can be shared and learn from. Uh, this is an important mission of Shorefront, where we in our mission, we say we collect, preserve, and educate. Uh, we welcome people from all walks of life to contribute stories, information. Uh, we have a teen group called the Legacy Keepers that develop their own project and add something to its archives. Uh, we have teen groups that develop an online blog about uh, teen life on a daily basis. Another group of teens that put together a book of poetry and spoken word. Many teen groups that put together photographic exhibits, photographing what's important to them, and they provide a historical context behind the photographs that they took. And many of these photographs, and we used disposable cameras, and we had these things on the wall, and professional photographers would come by and say, wow, what kind of cameras are they using for this? It's really good shots here. I said, oh, this this cheap $2 disposable camera. And I'm like, okay. We're going to donate some real cameras to you guys, but this is really good stuff. So what the teens can do today to add to our history, we look at that, uh, the teen groups, to kind of lead the way in what's important to their historical collections. And we are constantly collectors. All we do is we go around our, our board, our board of advisors, our honorary board members, go around the community and talk with people and share with people and bring in these photographs and collecting people's history, past, present, and for the future. What are these people doing today? Some of these people you see every day, we don't know what their background is and what they have done. Uh, you don't ever assume when you see somebody walking down the street, like, oh, that's just Joe Smo. But that person may have started an organization, built a church, started a business, tutored hundreds of kids, provided services to families in need done things that impacted things on the national level. So Shorefront does this, and we collect that, and we share with the communities. Thank you.